Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 26, Henry III, coming in smooth. Last week we discussed the remaining few years of Conrad II's reign, which, despite some setback in the trials of Adalbero of Carinthia and a pretty pointless Italian expedition, still counts as one of the most successful rules of the Middle Ages. Not only does Conrad leave an empire behind whose central authority is undisputed, but he also managed to live long enough for his heir and successor Henry III to grow up to adulthood before taking power. The transition from Conrad II to Henry III in 1039 is the first smooth handover of power since the transition from Otto I to Otto II in 972, so that's 67 years earlier. With these two exceptions, the death of a king or emperor had always been a period of huge uncertainty and upheaval. Henry the Fowler, Otto the Great, Otto III, Henry II and Conrad II all had to fight opponents for the throne, forcing the magnates to take sides. Once one side had won, the deck of cards was reshuffled and previously powerful men lose their positions, like the kingmaker Aribo of Mainz did in 1039. The transition to Henry III had been entirely smooth, allowing his magnates to breathe the sigh of relief. He had already been elected and crowned king in 1028. Beyond his royal title, he had already become Duke of Bavaria in 1027, Duke of Swabia in 1038, and in the same year he had become King of Burgundy. In 1041, two years after taking over, he also became Duke of Carinthia. On top of that, he controlled his family estates that accounted to almost a duchy in Franconia, as well as the royal demesne, which comprised the private Ottonian estate in Saxony, including the silver mines of Goslar. Never in medieval history did a German king concentrate so many powerful offices in his own hands. And that is not the only contrast to his father, who ascended the throne backed by merely a portion of his family's estate and the wealth his wife had brought into the marriage. Conrad was a six-foot-six action man who could ride a hundred miles in a day and fight when half submerged in a swamp. Henry III may have borne some physical similarity to his father and was broadly described as brave, but failed to match him in strength and energy. He fell ill from an unknown illness in 1046, from which he never fully recovered. Other than his father, Henry III had been diligently prepared for kingship from an early age. He was seven years old when his father ascended to the throne, and from then on he was educated by the leading clerics of his day. His first tutor was Bruno, Bishop of Augsburg and brother of the former Emperor Henry II. It is likely that young Henry III developed his notion of sacred kingship that was so similar to Henry II's under Bruno's influence. After Bruno's death in 1029, Henry is given over in the care of Egelbert, Bishop of Freising, another member of Henry II's inner circle. Another major influence was Vipo, the member of the imperial chancery and chronicler of Conrad II's life. Henry's worldview is very similar to the Emperor Henry II. He sees his role as emperor in providing peace to his people, both from external foes as from internal strife. The monarch's main job as a secular ruler is to uphold the law and dispense harsh justice if necessary, but show mercy whenever possible. But the emperor is not just some lay ruler. He is also the vicar of Christ on earth and a sacred individual making him responsible for the well-being of the Holy Church. And that means supporting the movement for church reform that had emanated from Cluny and other reform monasteries. Like Henry II, this Henry also believes that he has to make sure that prayer is effective and the sacraments are dispensed by individuals educationally and morally qualified. Behind that is a firm belief that the well-being in the afterlife is way more important than the well-being in the here and now, and the emperor as the lord of all that he surveys is primarily responsible to provide the infrastructure needed to prepare for the afterlife. And that includes competent priests who receive their office on merit rather than bribes, who live by the rules of the Bible, which includes increasingly the notion of celibacy. In that letter, the theological component, Henry III, differs from his father. Conrad II, whilst pious, had little time for theological disputations. He spent most of his time on horseback, sword in hand, rushing from one part of the empire to the other, bashing hats together. 
Henry III will do his fair share of travelling and axe-wielding, but his true pleasure lies in reading the Bible, prayer and listening to sermons. It's all party, party, party at the court of Henry III. But before you think he's just a bookish geek who shrinks away from his father, think again. In 1031, just 14 years old, he signs a peace agreement with the Hungarians that brings down the wrath of his father and the disgrace of his tutor, Egelbert of Freising. But Henry III does not kowtow. When a few years later the whole thing comes up again in the context of Adalbero of Corinthia's dismissal, Henry III refuses his father's explicit demands. Henry is now about 18 and his father, an absolute bull of a man with the subtlety of a sharpened axe, gets into such a rage with him he actually faints with anger. But Henry III still holds out. He only relents when his father backs him on his knees. There is some real steeliness in this character that may be covered by his preference for consensus and mercy, but as we will see, comes out on occasions when it's needed. But enough of the preliminaries, let's get into the action. When Conrad II died in 1039, Henry III takes over seamlessly. Though no coronation as such is required, he still goes through some sort of formal enthronization on Charlemagne's chair in Aachen, but he does not have to undertake the full royal progress as both Conrad II and Henry II had done. It is straight onto the desk and item one on the agenda. As you may remember, Conrad II had made a right old mess in Italy in the year before. Conrad had been called to mediate in a conflict between the Archbishop of Milan and his vassals, where he took the side of the rebellious vassals. That resulted in an uproar by the Italian clergy, which up until then had been the bedrock of imperial power in Italy. Conrad managed to make things really bad by apprehending the Archbishop of Milan. At that point, all inhabitants of Milan, who only weeks earlier were at each other's throat, united behind their poor Archbishop. They may dislike the current Archbishop, but that does not mean that there would be let foreigners run roughshod over the head of their city. Conrad ended up besieging the city of Milan without success, and in his desperation he even granted the smaller nobles the right to inherit their fiefs, even the fiefs of the church, which brought the red mist down over the Italian bishop's eyes. The whole thing was quite an impressive blunder, given that four years earlier the Milanese had been fielding an army to support the emperor's cause in Italy. So Henry III quickly reversed his father's policies. He made peace with Bishop Aribert of Milan and mended the relationship with the other bishops. He reverted to the tried and tested imperial policy of granting bishops fiefs and rights in exchange for support in war. Henry III also relied heavily on the system of missi, royal envoys, usually council bishops, who come to act on behalf of the king in resolving disputes and allocating fiefs that had become vacant. What he did not manage to do, though, was to revoke the vassal's inheritance rights his father had so foolishly granted. That brought some stability to the imperial rule in Italy, but not to the city of Milan. For the third time in a row, Bishop Aribert is getting expelled from his city, this time by a rebellion of the lower classes. It had nothing to do with anything Henry III had done, but was an indication of the shifting economic and demographic environment. When ten years earlier the big conflict was between the higher nobles, the Capitani, and their sub-vassals, the Valvasores, now it's between the third estate against the whole lot of nobles and bishops lording it over them. This is not the first city in Italy where the new class of merchants and artisans demand a role in the management of city affairs, but this is Milan, at this point possibly the largest city in Western Europe of almost a hundred thousand people. Again. The Milanese asks for mediation by the Emperor and Henry III takes a more delicate approach than his father. Through a combination of carrot and stick he gets the nobles to come down from their castles and horses and agree a new way of communal living in the city based on a city constitution. Within a hundred years most Italian cities will have constitutions that give its most important burghers participation in city affairs. But apart from this patch-up job, Italy did not feature highly in the imperial agenda of the first few years. Most of Henry III's energy in the first five years was taken up by the empire's neighbours to the east, Poland, Bohemia and Hungary. 
Poland, as you may remember from previous episodes, had tumbled into some sort of anarchy after the deposition of Mieszko II. Konrad II and the Grand Prince of Kiev had decided to split the Polish kingdom into three parts, given it to the three remaining members of the Piast families. One of these was Casimir, son of Mieszko II, and his wife Richeza, a German of highest aristocracy and granddaughter of Otto the Great. Casimir did not last long as one of these three rulers, but had the great advantage of not dying immediately because he could ask for asylum in Germany. In 1037, Casimir and his mother had another go at regaining the crown, which again failed. Now this effort compelled the largely pagan population to rise up and smash up the Christian infrastructure of the kingdom. Casimir tried again in 1038, but had to flee again, this time to Hungary. As I said before, the states east of the empire are a bit like communicating pipes. If Poland goes down, Bohemia rises, which is exactly what happened. In 1039, Bratislaus, Duke of Bohemia, invaded Poland. He marched almost unopposed to the former Polish royal heartland and took away the relics of St. Adalbert from the cathedral in Gniezno. Adalbert, that famous friend of Otto III, was not any old saint, but THE saint of Eastern Europe. He was revered for baptizing King Stephen of Hungary. He had been Bishop of Prague where he had performed many miracles and had died on a mission to the Prussians. Emperor Otto III had come in person to pray barefoot in a hair shirt at his grave. With the saintly relics of Adalbert in hand, Bratislav could hope to have his own archbishopric, which would make the Bohemian church independent from German influence. Remember that Mainz still had control over the bishopric of Prague, putting Bohemia at a disadvantage compared to Poland and Hungary, who both had their own archbishops reporting directly to the Pope. Now apart from the spiritual trophies, Bratislav also took the rich lands of Silesia for himself. This rise of Bohemian power was intolerable for Henry III and seemed also for Yaroslav, the Grand Prince of the Kievan Rus. The two agreed to help young Casimir to create order in Poland. Yaroslav gave Casimir his daughter and a lot of gold and Henry III gave him a thousand heavily armed soldiers and they sent him on his merry way. This time Casimir succeeded. He could establish some form of central government and embarked on a long and arduous process of putting Poland back together again, which is why he's known to Polish history as Casimir the Restorer. In exchange for this generous help, Casimir recognized Henry III as his overlord, confirming vows made by his predecessors Mieszko II and Beszprym. Sending young Casimir off to remake Poland was however not sufficient to put Bratislaus of Bohemia back into his box. Henry III mustered an army almost as soon as he heard about Bratislaus' invasion of Poland. War is avoided in the last minute when Bratislaus sends hostages, including his own son, promises to come to Germany and give homage to Henry III as well as to perform what was commended of him. That, however, turned out to be a lie. Bratislaus saw no need to submit to this fresh and untested king. Instead, he used the time to strengthen his defences, made a deal with Hungary and expanded his military, awaiting Henry III in the following year. At least, initially, Bratislaus' plan worked and Henry III's army perished in an attempt to take a border defence. The, the losses must have been very severe. The chronicler Hermann of Reichenau reported that the king departed with the loss of very many knights and princes and with his purpose unfulfilled. Even worse, he had to hand back the hostages in exchange for his captured men, making him look really weak and incompetent. But there's always next year. And so Henry mustered an even bigger army, as usual, mostly from the imperial church. The abbot of Fulda reports that even though most of his soldiers, including their commander, had died in the campaign of 1040, he had to provide an even larger contingent in 1041. Now this time Henry III was cleverer. Instead of attacking the border defences, he snuck into the country by an unfrequented route with one army, whilst the Markgraf of Meissen came by another route further east, and the Markgraf of the Eastern March came up from the south. Once Henry and his armies were in Bohemia, Bratislaus ran out of options and had to give in. He came to a royal assembly in Regensburg in 1041 and renounced his acquisitions in Poland, except for Silesia, for which he had to pay tribute. 
he made an oath of fealty and Henry III accepted him as his vassal. Now that was the end of Bratislav's dream to become the next Boleslav the Brave. One of the things that hampered Bratislaus in his last campaign was the loss of Hungarian support. In his first round, King Peter Orseolo of Hungary had come to his aid and attacked the Eastern March, aka Austria. This time he could not, since King Peter Orseolo himself had been expelled from his country. Now there's an obvious question here, which is, who is King Peter Orseolo? Even if, against all the odds, you do not speak Hungarian, you would know that this is not a Hungarian name. The confusion is all my fault, as usual. Though Hungarian affairs have popped up regularly these last few episodes, I have put off bringing you up to speed about the fascinating history of Hungary. Now we can no longer postpone, and it is time to bring you all up to speed with Hungary again, and I promise I will not slack again. Last time we took a closer look at Hungary was as long ago as episode 6, which was just after the battle on the Lechfeld in 955, which brought an end to the Magyar incursions. After the defeat, Hungary reconsolidated under the long reign of Prince Geza from 972 to 997. Geza decisively shifted Hungary towards Christianity, and in particular favoured Western Christianity over the Greek version. This religious distinction had an underlying political and ethnic dimension as well. After the emperor in Constantinople had subjugated the Bulgars, Hungary had a border with Byzantium in the south and the empire in the west. As tensions between the west and the east intensified, the country balanced on a tightrope. The southern and eastern part of the country, the so-called Black Hungarians, leaned towards Constantinople, while the so-called White Hungarians leaned towards Roman Christianity and the Ottonian emperors. This conflict and the still resistant pagan population led to regular revolts and uprisings. Geza's son, who was initially called Vajk, or Vajk, or my Hungarian is really terrible. Anyway, he took over in around 997. Vajk, or however you pronounce it, had been brought up in the Roman Christian tradition and had been married to Gisela, the sister of Emperor Henry II. Transition was anything but smooth and the first act of the young king was to use soldiers sent by Gisela's father to besiege and capture his uncle Kopani, who had claimed the throne. Kopani was hung, drawn and quartered, and parts of his body were sent around the realm pour décourager les autres. In around 1000 or 1001, Vajk became king of Hungary and took the name of Stephen, later known as Saint Stephen. The Hungarian view of the coronation was that Hungary received the crown and scepter from the Pope and that Stephen was crowned without having to become a vassal of either the Emperor or the Pope. The, in inverted commas, German version is that the crown and scepter was indeed sent by Pope Sylvester II. But that Sylvester II acted in this matter, as well as in all others, with the favour and urging of Emperor Otto III. In other words, that Hungary had accepted, ultimately, suzerainty of the empire. Whichever way that happened, St. Stephen ruled for an astonishing 40 years until his death in 1039. During his reign he turned Hungary from a federation of steppe nomad tribes into a medieval kingdom, modelled on the Carolingian Empire. He introduced roughly 40 counties managed by counts who were royal officials. He established two archbishoprics and eight bishoprics, as well as many monasteries. Other than in Bohemia, the Hungarian church always only recognized the papal authority and was not part of the imperial church system. In 1028, or maybe a lot earlier, Stephen removed the last magnate still adhering to the Eastern Church, Ashtoni, prince of the Black Hungarians, who ruled an area equivalent to today's Romania. After that, all of Hungary, which was a lot larger than today's state of Hungary, had become part of the Roman Catholic Church, tying this country firmly into Western Europe. Despite the clear religious orientation towards Rome, Hungary still had to balance its link to the West with maintaining good relationships with Byzantium. For instance, it seems that Hungary would at times provide troops to help the Byzantine efforts to subjugate the Bulgarians. So Hungary found itself in a situation not dissimilar to Venice, as the link between West and East. Both were sort of rooted in the Western Empire and were Catholic, 
but also had close links to the empire in Constantinople. Venice began creating a string of ports along the Dalmatian coast, while Hungary controlled much of the hinterland of these ports. Though the two states could not be more different, one a sophisticated independent city republic built on international maritime trade, and the other a nascent medieval kingdom created by steppe nomads, they formed a close alliance. To cement that alliance, Stephen married his sister to the Venetian doge Otto Orseolo. That is the same Otto Orseolo that Otto III had become godfather to. During the reign of Emperor Henry II, relationships between Hungary and Germany were very cordial, in part because of the close family relationship. St. Stephen had one son with his wife Gisela, called Imri or Emmerich in German. At Conrad II's election in 1024, this Emmerich was the nephew and hence the closest relative of the previous Emperor Henry II. Nevertheless, the chronicles do not report any explicit claim made by Emmerich or his father during the election. That was different when it came to the succession in Bavaria after the death of his duke in 1027. Bavaria had traditionally been run by the family of the former Emperor Henry II. Emmerich therefore had some claim and may have sounded out the Bavarian nobles for his chances of election. Bavaria would have been a great prize for Hungary lying just across the border. However, the plan failed and as we know, the duchy went to Henry III. The rejection of the Bavarian succession added to tensions with the empire. Other issues included Conrad's aggressive policy against Venice, which led, amongst other things, to a deposition of Stephen's brother-in-law, Otto Orseolo, who fled to Hungary with his wife and little son, Peter. Skirmishes, mainly by Bavarian border counts, escalated into all-out war after 1028. This was mainly led by Bavarian and Corinthian troops under the formal command of the 11-year-old Henry III. That war, as we heard before, did not go well, and Henry suffered a severe defeat, forcing him to agree a peace in 1031, whereby Hungary gained a stretch of land on the eastern frontier of the empire. Conrad II did not like this treaty one bit, and it resulted in the dismissal of Henry III's tutor and guardian, Egelbert of Freising, who I mentioned earlier in this episode. After 1031, the relationship with the empire improved, mainly because Stephen's son and heir, Emmerich, died in a hunting accident and took all claims to the Bavarian title to his grave. Meanwhile in Hungary, the situation became complicated. The closest relative of Stephen in the male line was a man called Vazul. My pronunciation of Hungarian is totally wrong, and please forgive me, I just can't get it right. Anyway... Basil was believed to harbour pagan sympathies, and St. Stephen therefore rejected his claim and appointed his nephew Peter Orseolo instead as his heir. That is the Peter Orseolo I mentioned earlier, the son of a Venetian doge and an Hungarian princess. Basil was obviously unhappy about that and got into conflict with St. Stephen. Whether he made an attempt to have him murdered is unclear, but St. Stephen had him seized and killed anyway. According to some sources, the saintly ruler had his enemy's ears filled with molten lead, a sort of discount version of the pouring of molten gold down Crassus's throat. Vassal's three sons, Levent, Bandru and Bela, were expelled from the kingdom. When St. Stephen died in 1038, his nephew Peter Orseolo, as planned, took over. As a foreigner, he lacked support amongst the Hungarian elite, and hence relied heavily on German and Italian foreigners who had migrated to Hungary during the reign of St. Stephen. In foreign policy, he took an active stance against the empire, and in particular against Henry III, presumably because the Salians had forced him and his father into exile. He supported Bratislav of Bohemia in his raid in Poland and used the opportunity to invade Bavaria and Austria. Given this policy was quite successful, it would have likely continued if Peter could have managed his domestic issues a bit more successfully. His key policy was to increase the royal demesne at the expense of Hungarian nobles and magnates. This policy overstretched when he seized the lands of the royal widow, Gisela, the wife of St. Stephen and imperial princess. That pushed the party of Stephen into opposition, who deposed Peter and then replaced him with another nephew of Stephen, Samuel Abbas. Peter fled to his brother-in-law, Markgraf Adalbert of Austria, whose lands he had raided just the previous year. 
There he found a surprisingly warm welcome, and Adalbert recommended him to Emperor Henry III. Go figure. In 1041 he showed up at the Royal Assembly in Regensburg, where his former best mate and comrade-in-arms, Bratislaus of Bohemia, was also asking for imperial mercy. Now Samuel Abbas, on the other hand, had no particular beef with the empire, and was also trying to agree some sort of lasting peace. However, negotiations failed, probably because Henry III insisted on full submission to his suzerainty and return of the land seized in 1031. War was now inevitable, and Samuel Abba attacked Bavaria and Austria in 1042. The army sent against Austria was destroyed by Margraf Adalbert, whilst the army sent against Bavaria caused a lot of damage. It took Henry until the autumn to raise troops and push the Hungarians back. Henry, or more likely his Markgraf Adalbert, sacked Bratislava, then a Hungarian fortress, and took most of what is now Slovakia. The two sides agreed a peace treaty in 1043, whereby Samuel Abbas returned the lands seized in 1031, which were given to the Counts of Austria, thereby much improving their fortunes. But by 1044 the King of Hungary was back at it. Henry III mustered a comparatively small army and invaded. Samuel Abba, whose army was much larger, let Henry progress fairly deep into Hungarian territory, presumably hoping to cut Henry off from supplies and capture the king himself. However, Henry mounted a surprise attack by his armoured riders, having shipped his army across the river Raab. The large Hungarian army turned to flight or surrendered right there and then. King Peter was reinstated as king and Samuel Abba was captured and killed shortly afterwards. With this Battle of Manfor, Henry III had achieved a clean sweep of the eastern frontier. The rulers of Poland, Bohemia and Hungary are now all vassals of the empire. This completes his father's policy that started with breaking the empire of Boleslav the Brave. Savor the moment, because only two years later King Peter is deposed again and presumably killed. His successor, Andrew, a son of Vasil, who had been so cruelly killed by the saintly King Stephen, will take over. He and his successors will no longer make the mistake of letting an imperial army loose inside their kingdom. Despite all their internal squabbles, the Hungarians will strengthen and man their border defences, making all subsequent attempts to invade futile. But this is two years down the line. Right now, Henry is the master of the East, Duke and Lord of Burgundy in southern Germany. Two items are still outstanding before he climbs to the absolute high point of the medieval empire, asserting control over the last two remaining duchies, Lothringia and Saxony, and then the big biggie, the reform of the papacy. Some, or maybe all of it, will be in the next episode. I hope you will join us again, and in the meantime, if you enjoy the podcast, why don't you tell your friends about it? If they want to check it out, send them to my website, historyofthegermans.com, or my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. Thanks a lot for doing that. <laughs>